first. So I want to begin by inviting you to think about in this whole theme of thankfulness, what are you thankful for? You know, when you reflect over the last 25 years of of your life, and Kai's not 25 yet, and Dorian and Joseph are not 25, and Melody, and but you know, most of us are. But when you think about over the last 25 years of your life, what stands out for you as something that you could be grateful for? What are your experiences, or what relationships have you had? that you could be grateful for. Maybe for some of you, you'd say, well, that's the birth of a child or, or the birth of a, of a grandchild causes me to be thankful. How many purchased a house in the last 25 years? Anybody show hands? Maybe that's something that you're feeling thankful for. You know, yesterday I officiated uh, my first wedding here at Palm Harvest Church uh, for Tyler Noble and Alexis Oso. And, you know, as we, as we gathered, here's a young family that are young, you know, that is starting their, their marriage relationship. But maybe in the t- t- show of hands in the last 25 years, how many of you have, were married? You know, Joe and Lisa? Yeah, okay. A lot of us. Beto, Millie, S- Stephen and Kelsey? Yeah. How many years have you guys been married now? Five years. Woohoo. That's awesome. You know, how many of you in the last 25 years learned to drive a car? You're still learning? Joe drives with his hands, right? We all, a lot of us do. Or maybe you, in the last 25 years, when you think about something that you're thankful for, you think about a dream vacation that you had. You know, for Robin and I, we had, we've had the privilege, I've been had the privilege of being like in Israel like five times. You know, that's, that's something I'm really, I'm grateful for. It shaped how I read the Bible. It shapes how I, 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 I even preach and teach. You know, maybe for some of you, the best of all, maybe in the last 25 years, maybe a few of you have even given your heart to Jesus. That's a pretty cool experience as you think back. What are you grateful for? What are you thankful for? Well, today we're going to start this new series, as as Beto and I have already mentioned. And for the next several weeks, leading us through this national holiday of Thanksgiving, we're going to look at this new series, this theme called Thankful. And for today's conversation, I've entitled my message, Thankful Prayer. Thankful prayer. And so if you have a Bible, whether it's in paper or digital form, I invite you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. We're going to read a story about a, a, a man, and I'll un- unpack the context here in a second. But let me just read the verses for us, and then we'll see how we can apply maybe some of the lessons found here to our, our daily life. So thankful prayer is the theme. I'm going to start reading at verse 5, Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. We'll have the verses here up on the screen behind me or those of you watching online in front of you. And to try to picture your scene in your mind as the story unfolds, this is what we are told. When Jesus re- returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him, Lord, my young servant or my young child lies in bed paralyzed and in terrible pain. Well, Jesus said, oh, I'll come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am a man under authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go or come and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. But many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, go back home because you believed it has happened. And the young servant was healed that same hour. You know, when we read the Gospel of Matthew, particularly the first early chapters, we know that just by the sake of where it's at chronologically, we know that Jesus is just beginning his earthly ministry. But if you look at verse 1 of this chapter, you'll be told how Jesus already, there are large crowds who are following him. And it's easy to understand why people would want to follow Jesus, uh, even though it's just really early in, so the infancy of his, his public ministry is because Jesus was a man for the people. 
especially for those who are marginalized. You know, here in the United States right now, here in America, we are in the throes of a, a political uh, race a, a, where two people uh, are vying for your vote, Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, to be the next president of the United States. And if you listen to uh, sort of their speeches and, and you, you know, watch any kind of social media, whether it's television or on the internet, one of the things that you will hear, one of the messages that both of these candidates are trying to convince you and me, the voter, is that they are a person for the people. They're both trying to convince you and me, especially so, that they are for the lower to middle class. Well, I don't know if that's really true, whether Kamala Harris and Donald Trump are for the middle class, but what I do know and what I do believe is that when we study the life and the ministry of Jesus, one thing is certain, and he was definitely a leader who was for the people. And this miracle that we just read reinforces this truth, and so let's unpack it. So here in Matthew chapter 8, we just read this story where we're introduced to a man who is described as a centurion, right? A Roman officer who serves in the Roman military. And in the verses that we read, we're told that this Roman military leader approaches Jesus or sort of with this concern that he has for this child that serves in his house. In his, in his household, and what's this child afflicted with? He says he's paralyzed, and he's in terrible pain, right? And in his actions, and in his sort of interchange with Jesus, I propose that there are four things that you and I can learn about thankful prayer. And the first thing is this, if you're taking notes, write this down, point number one in your app, and that is thankful prayer begins with an identified need. Thankful prayer begins with an identified need. You know, sisters and brothers, when you survey the relationships in your life, at home, at work, you know, in your community, who are you concerned about? Are you concerned about a son? Are you concerned about a daughter? Are you concerned about a coworker? Who are you concerned about? You know, and when you ponder these individuals in your circles of influence, who you, maybe God has put on your heart to be concerned about them, what specific needs do they have? Thankful prayer always begins with an identified need. You know, when we look at this story, why did this Roman officer make his appeal to Jesus? You got any ideas about that? Is it safe for us to assume that this Roman centurion was a man of influence? What do you think? I think so. I think we can assume that. As a Roman centurion, he obviously was a man who had connections. He probably had access to the best doctors in the region. And so why seek out Jesus? This is a non-Jewish, right, Gentile man. He obviously is a man of faith. But why seek out Jesus? Why not utilize the resources in his own network? I propose it's because he believed that Jesus had the spiritual authority to do something. You think that's a safe assumption? I propose that this Roman officer believed that Jesus could help his servant. So don't miss this. This man approached Jesus with the mindset of what the end result could be, right? And that's a great description of, of what faith is. I identify a need. In my mind or in my heart, I sort of know what the desired outcome that I, I, I want. And then I approach God with this, this mindset in prayer that he has the capacity to give me this outcome that I hope will take place in the life of my friend or loved one for this need that they have. I approach God in prayer with a thankful perspective. 
You know, whenever I approach God in prayer, I will often say something like this, and you've probably heard me. God, I thank you in advance for how you're going to step into this situation, right? God, I thank you in advance for the way you are going to address this need that I'm thankful about, concerned about. God, I thank you in advance for how you're going to bring fruition to this end result that I'm hoping for in the regards to these people in my life that I'm concerned about. You know, this Roman centurion, notice, look at here, he, he goes to Jesus really with this belief that Jesus can do what for this child? Heal him, right? His child servant who was in bed, paralyzed, and in terrible pain, thankful prayer always begins with an identified need. Point number two, write this down. Thankful prayer is fueled by heartfelt urgency. Thankful prayer is fueled by heartfelt urgency. Look again at verse 5 here in, in your Bible story. Here in verse 5, Matthew, the gospel writer, describes how this Roman officer takes the initiative to, to seek out Jesus. But notice what this commander doesn't do. When you look at these verses, notice that he doesn't specifically ask Jesus to heal his servant, does he? Rather, he simply tells Jesus what he's concerned about. In fact, we're told that he pleads, which to me is a, a heart condition, right? It, it suggests the urgency of, of what his assignment is here. He says that he pleads with Jesus on behalf of his sick servant, and he says, Lord, my young servant lies in bed paralyzed, and in terrible pain. Thankful prayer is fueled by heartfelt urgency. This past Friday, I, I called Jerry Geislin, who many of you know. Jerry's been a part of our church for almost uh, since the beginning. She's uh, almost for sure 20 years or so. In the early days of, of Palm Harvest, Jerry was a part of our worship team. She's got this beautiful alto voice, and she's really uh, amazing at, at harmonizing, uh, you know, adding these additional parts to sort of the melody line. And, and, and Jerry, as, as most of you know, is right now she's fighting cancer. And she's about six weeks or so uh, into her chemotherapy. And as we were talking on, on Friday, she was sharing. She said, Mike, I so want to come to Palm Harvest Church and be a part of, of the, you know, the, the public worship gathering and the service. And she said, I will get up in the morning. Uh, and she said, I'll have my clothes laid out. And she said, I'll, I'll get dressed. She said, by the time I get dressed, by the time I get my clothes on, she said, I'm gassed. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm out of energy. She said, I'm so tired that she said, oftentimes I don't even have the energy to watch online, you know, while it's live. She said, I just go back to bed. And if you've ever dealt with cancer, some of you may know exactly what she's talking about. She says, you know, I'm in my pajamas, I get dressed, and then whew, I'm back, back under the sheets, back getting some sleep. You know, for those of you who know Jerry, you know that she's not one to complain or host any pity parties, although none of us would be critical of her if she did. But rather, when you talk to her, you will hear in her words, even in her state of just fatigue, this, this heart of gratitude. Gratitude for her physicians. Gratitude for her friends and, and family. Gratitude for this life that she, that God has given her to live. You know, I, I kept watching the clock. I thought, you know, man, I don't want to take up a ton of her time, but the, the minutes just kept, you know, clicking off and off. And the, and the more we talked, the more, the stronger she got. And it was like she wanted to encourage me, even though I was calling to encourage her. Now, hear me on this. Jerry's not giving up on life. She's nor, you know, she, has she given up on God? She's a fighter. 
And really, that's what helps Jerry maintain her positivity, yes, and her positive outlook, yes, in her understanding that God has the capacity to heal her, which is the same understanding that this Roman centurion had and shared as he shares his concern with Jesus in our Bible story. So would you write this down, point number three in your app notes, and that is thankful prayer is emboldened by an understanding of God's capacity. Thankful prayer is emboldened by an understanding of God's capacity. You know, in our Bible story, this Roman officer didn't need to tell Jesus what he hoped for in regards to his sick servant. He simply focused on Jesus' capacity to heal his sick servant, right? His focus was on Jesus. His eyes were hard set on Jesus, not on his obstacle. You know, I suspect that some of you here today or maybe tuning in online are facing an obstacle in your life, maybe a challenge that is bigger than yourself. You know, when we carry burdens that are outside of our control, I, I submit that it's natural for us to feel fear. It's natural for us to be maybe feel worry in our, in our mind, in our heart. You know, I would imagine there's a lot of people right now on the East Coast who have survived Hurricane Helene and Hurricane Milton who have experienced their world turned upside down. You know, you've likely seen the news reports. I suspect that there are some of you here today or some of you tuning in online who also have a sense of, of you feel like maybe you're in the throes of your own personal hurricane. I encourage you to plead to Jesus with the emotions that you feel in your heart. Be unapologetic about laying before him what your need is. Appeal to him your conviction that he has the capacity to do something. Why? Because thankful prayer is emboldened by an understanding of God's capacity. You know, in our Bible story, Matthew, the gospel writer, tells us that in response to this Roman officer's pleading, I don't know if it was common for Roman officers to plead, you think? I mean, talk about humility. Talk about, you know, lowering himself. Talk about an example of how much he really cared for this, this child in, in his household. But in response to this Roman officer's pleading, Jesus is what? What was Jesus' response? He says, I'll come to your house, right? I'll heal your, your child servant. And in Jesus' response, what message is he preaching? Jesus is saying, brothers and sisters, I hear you. Is he not? He's saying to this Roman officer, even though you're a Gentile, even though you're not a Jew and part of the church, right, in quotes, so to speak, I see you. I hear the call of your heart. I hear the concern that you have for your servant. I hear your prayer. So what's the transferable concept? What's Matthew, the gospel writer, telling us here? Is he not saying, hey, people, hey, Mike, hey, Palm Harvest, Jesus is in the business of hearing the sincere prayers, catch this, of sinners. Sisters and brothers, don't let the devil convince you otherwise. You know, sometimes we, I think, go to God and we go, I'm not worthy of this. And that's true, we're not worthy of this. But this Bible story illustrates that even when you're outside the church, so to speak, as this Roman officer was, we can come to God with this thankful, expectant heart, and this Bible story reinforces this truth that Jesus has time for you and me, that Jesus is interested in you and me, that Jesus, catch this, wants to come to our house. 
that Jesus wants to step into our situation. That's the message of this Bible story. I find it rather intriguing to read how this Roman officer rejects Jesus' offer of going to his house. Why would he do that? I mean, if you had a superstar, your favorite, you know, actor or actress, if they said, hey, I'll come to your house, would you say, no, you know? So why would this Roman officer push away Jesus' offer to come to his house? I don't think it's because he was poor. I don't think it's probably because he, he felt maybe embarrassed by his, his, his home accommodations, that wasn't his reason for saying no to Jesus. Why did he say no to Jesus? Well, the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that this man with authority understood how people with authority, intuitively how power operates, yes? He understood that if you were a person with power, with government authority, that you simply tell people what you want done, and they would be inclined and or required unquestionably to carry forth your directive. And so in his own words, this Roman soldier articulates his understanding that a person with authority gives orders and people do what? They follow them, yes? Yes. And Jesus, in his mind, had authority. Look again at what, he, what we're told here in verse 8. Lord, this officer said, I'm not worthy to have you come into my house. Jesus, just say the word from where you are, and I know that my servant will be what? Will be healed. Thankful prayer is always emboldened by an understanding of God's capacity. So how did Jesus respond? What's verse 10 tell us? Let's read it again. I'm going to start reading at verse 10. So when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. I haven't seen faith like this among the church people, right? That's what Jesus is saying. I haven't seen this, among, this kind of faith among the Jews who claim to be followers of God. I tell you this, that many Gentiles, non-Jews, will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who were legends in the Israel faith, Israeli faith, the Jewish faith, at the feast in the kingdom of God. Again, here we, we, we looked at this in our last series. There's going to be food in heaven for you and I to eat. But Jesus is saying that even among the, the, the heroes of the faith are going to be people who are outside, so to speak, the church. So write this down, point number four, in your notes. Thankful prayer is experienced because of God's fairness. Thankful prayer is experienced because of God's fairness. You say, Mike, what do you mean by that? You know, in biblical days, Jews, as most of you know, did not associate with Gentiles. Gentiles were considered to be religiously unclean. They were someone to be avoided. The Jewish nation, they looked forward to this day when the Messiah would return, and together they would enjoy this fellowship of heaven's, get this, exclusive banquet table. No Gentiles would be allowed in their mindset, but Jesus sets the record straight here, doesn't he? Jesus in verse 11 tells us that God's heaven is open to those who exercise faith. Jew and, help me out, Gentile, right? Churchgoer and non-churchgoer. God hears, Jesus is telling us, the sinner's prayer. Let that truth sink in. You know what that means for you, don't you? It means that God hears you when you pray. God hears me when I pray. Why? Not because of who we are, but because of who God is. God, we're told here, is fair. And thankful prayer is experienced because of God's fairness. 
So let's land the plane. I want you to ponder a couple of questions. Let's go back to where we started. For whom are you concerned? For whom does your heart break? Is there someone in your life who you think would benefit from Jesus' healing touch? Perhaps physically, because they're facing a health crisis. Perhaps emotionally, because they're facing a relationship crisis. Perhaps financially, because they're experiencing a work crisis. I got called this week from somebody who just lost their job. Creates a crisis in their life. Pastor Mike, can you help me out? For whom are you concerned? For whom does your heart break? We're going to go to prayer. David, join me up here on stage. And as we go to prayer, I want you to think of someone in your life who you can identify as being in a crisis. Now, rather than ask Jesus to remedy the crisis, I simply want us to take to Jesus the issue that this person or these people are facing in their life, much like this Roman officer did. Okay, so everybody put everything down for a second. Let's take a deep breath in. Just inhale. Hold it for a second. Exhale. Now in your heart and in your mind, I invite you and encourage you to pray and say this. Say, Jesus, right now, I present to you and you fill in the name of the person who you're thinking about. Jesus, right now, I present to you, who's that young servant in your household? Who's the one who's sick and experiencing pain, whatever that pain may be in their life? Now tell Jesus, say, Jesus, right now in their life, they are dealing with, and you fill in the blank. What school should I go to? What job should I take? It doesn't have to be a negative thing. Maybe there's a health crisis. Maybe there's a relationship crisis. Maybe there's a financial crisis. What is it though? Jesus, right now, this friend, this loved one, this person who you put on my heart, right now they're dealing with this. Maybe there's an addiction that they're facing. Now breathe in. I'm just gonna give you a few moments of silence. I just want you to breathe in. And breathe out. Sit in the truth that Jesus is fair. That Jesus can be trusted. And in this moment, as you breathe in and you breathe out, and and I'm going to stop talking here in a second. I want you to believe, I encourage you to believe in your heart that Jesus has the capacity to help them. Believe in your heart that Jesus wants to join them in their situation. Believe in your heart that he is fair and that he hears you right now. And so with a thankful heart, say say this, say, Jesus, my loved one needs a miracle. And I believe that you have the authority to help them. And so today, I petition your fair character and plead with you to unleash your authority into their life situation. Just present the person to that God. with a heart of urgency, say, God, here's their need that I can see.
Now pray this. Say, God, with a thankful heart, Jesus, with a thankful heart, this is my prayer in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen and amen.